Good evening. <coughs> Good evening. This is Occupier Caitlin. I am back live. Welcome back to those who've been waiting for this to come on. We are here at the First Unitarian Church here in Des Moines, where Dennis and Elizabeth Kucinich will present their program Beyond GMOs, Nourishing the World. And so we are waiting for this thing to begin. People are coming in. And the banner that you see above the podium is one that we actually had made last year. We actually have two of them up, and uh, then the sign on the front is one of the first ones that we had made. This is the first evening event for Occupy the World Food Prize. Tomorrow will be the Food Sovereignty Alliance Food Sovereignty Prize Award Ceremony. That will be at the Historical Building in the Auditorium tomorrow at 7 o'clock Central. And I will be broadcasting that live, hopefully. I haven't yet had a chance to get in there to uh, check signal quality, but I'll get there early enough that I can do that before event starts and if I cannot get a good stream then I will simply record it and then upload it to YouTube later and to my live stream channel and then Thursday is a direct action at the Capitol that will start at 6 o'clock not 7 so I need to change that on the, my Facebook event so I can do that later when I get home I can update that the food, the World Food Prize World Banquet starts at 7, but the protest will start at 6 o'clock. And that will go up until who knows when. I'm not sure how long Thursday night, how long that will go. We'll just play it by ear. But last year we had the Food Sovereignty Prize winners join us, and we are hoping that uh, Thursday night, again, the Food Sovereignty Prize winners will join us for that. <laughs> Hello. Tonight we have a musician joining us. Okay, so here we go. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. We're gonna give people a time to get in here, get your seat. If you're outside there, we're getting ready. Come on and get a seat. I'm going to sing a song and then we're going to turn it off, turn it over to the rest of the uh, people here. Uh, my name is Mike Miles. I'm a, I'm a farmer. Yay! I'm, a, I'm a Catholic worker farmer from northern Wisconsin. And uh, a couple years ago, Frank said, Mike, come to Des Moines and help us protest the World Food Prize. And I had no idea what he was talking about. That, made, that was language that made no sense to me whatsoever. So uh, last year I came down. And I went, oh, cow, you got to be kidding me. This is what? So uh, we're, we're glad that we're here tonight. We're glad that this alternative view is building, that a venue has been created to get some more discussion going on out there. It's very exciting to be here and be a part of that. Uh, I do some singing, but it, up by us, we, we've already had an inch of snow on the ground. And yeah, 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 and uh, and it's been like freezing overnights and stuff. So we've been doing a lot of harvesting, working in the garden. I haven't been singing a lot. 
Uh, I'm going to do the best I can. I sang in the car on the way down here today for five hours. <laughs> so uh, hopefully I remember the words. Uh, this song here uh, is one of my favorite folk songs of all time. It's by a guy named Jack Hardy uh, who died. Uh, so I keep a song going. It's one of the best folk songs ever. I ran for Congress twice uh, with the Green Party. And this was, my, uh, this was my campaign song. So I used to like bust with my guitar case down on the ground and I'd be places and I'd, I'd feed the guitar case and, 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 um, and that's how I made money for my campaign. It was great fun. So, so I, I hope I remember all the way, way too many words in this song. Uh, I'll see what happens.
control of food production and objects to the GMO corporate agenda of big ag to dominate and control food production around the world mm -hmm. because it disenfranchises local small farmers to produce food that actually shows up on a dinner plate. At CCI, we put people first before profits and polluters. Yes. This week we've got an incredibly interesting three days of events, and tonight we're kicking things off with some really exciting speakers. But the debate over food production actually began this last Saturday with a great article on Saturday's register, uh, register by food activist Sharon Donovan. Hope you had a chance to read it. If not, Sue followed that up on Sunday with another big piece in her column the following day. So we are here, we on. I'd like to just take a minute to invite uh, some groups to stand up and identify themselves. Uh, first of all, is the Food Sovereignty Price group here today? Anybody here representing that group? Yeah, they're right there. Right there.
through a, a number of decades, uh, is standing over here on the side. And uh, as I uh, uh, have had an opportunity in sort of bringing up to date uh, my uh, uh, latest tours around and taking me to the uh, United Nations. And so I was at the United Nations. Unfortunately, I was in front of the cameras. I was in the basement in a work group and uh, with two or three different ones. And I found myself with three mayors. And so uh, it was the, the mayor of uh, Rio de Janeiro and, and the, uh, uh, the mayor of Melbourne, uh, Australia, and a bunch of bankers and insurance guys. And we're talking about saving the world, and I thought this was sort of interesting. And uh, the fact that they're saying, you know, what's Des Moines doing here? And uh, <laughs> I, I had to tell them they haven't been reading Forbes much lately, or they know why I'm there. We're the number one place in the United States to live and raise a family and do all those things. <laughs> But most importantly, uh, you know, there's so many concerned citizens that are worried not just about what's going on today, but what's going on for the next generation. What about our kids? What about our grandkids? What about our great-grandkids? And oh, by the way, as the Native Americans would say, how about the seventh generation and beyond uh, ahead of us? So as we think about that, and we look out in the audience, and, and uh, hope and wish as we think about how to engage everybody in our community. Uh, young people, old people, rich people, poor people, black people, white people, males, females, everybody needs to, to step up and be part of this discussion. And uh, I, I will also tell you that one of my funnier moments, uh, and I will direct this sort of to, to Dennis because I know that this is a, a warm spot for him, uh, peace and, and, and those kinds of issues. So I'm supposed to get credentialed to go in uh, last last year to the same kind of an event. And uh, they're handing out credentials on 2nd Avenue and 46th Street. And, and uh, for whatever reason, they'd switch to 43rd Street. And I go over there, and they're gone. So there's some people standing there, and they're handing out. He's, he's got a sign, and it says, uh, World Peace. And so I said, you know, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm handing out credentials because we're, uh, you know, the, the uh, faith-based community and working with the, uh, the president of Costa Rica and, and the United Nations on peace issues. And so uh, I didn't have a credential, but at any rate, I said, congratulations. This is great work. You know, that's, that's what we all need to do. We need to think about uh, peace and food in the future of the, of the world rather than bombs and war. And so, yeah. I said, you know what, I said, I'm glad to see you guys working on this. I said, I'm, I'm uh, a member of the uh, World Mayors for Peace. He says, really? He said, where are you from? From one Iowa. And he says, really? He said, there's a credential, come on in with me. So I go into the world peace deal, and I was there for climate and, and those kinds of issues. And uh, it was very fascinating because I got like a standing ovation from this work group in there doing it in the president of Costa Rica. And she and I uh, uh, had our picture taken together, and it was uh, quite a moment. But it's interesting how all these things go together. Yeah. And, and they all meet, and there's sort of a nexus uh, uh, there. Last week, before we started the United Nations Peace, prior to that, we had a sort of a, a discussion about how does nuclear test bans, uh, peace, where does it intersect with climate change? So it was a very interesting uh, piece, and I, uh, I, I was the local government speaker. And I'll just tell you that... Um, they can make all those decisions at the United Nations and have those, those heads of state there. And they can talk to us about the future of the world and all their great plans. But everything takes place someplace. In a city, in a town, on a farm, someplace in this country, around the world. And they need to have local government, people, in those negotiations as they talk about the future of the planet. Because if they bring us in later, they have no idea what our capabilities are 
And uh, I think that, that all of us need to rise up and have our voices so that Washington understands, so that New York understands, the United Nations understand that the issues that we're talking about, about the future of water, the future of food, the future of our families, the future of this country, and as we think about Iowa, those of us that, that have spent our lives right here, and uh, I know you're going to hear uh, about a little bit about water. My friend, Mr. Stowe, and I uh, travel around in, sometimes in the same circles. And it's uh, interesting to, to listen to folks talk about it. And my grandfather uh, and my mother came off the farm, up by Boone. And my grandfather used to tell me about the soil. And we're just stewards. We're just here for a little bit of time. And we ought to be building the soil. We ought to be building the future. And it's about how we do it. And he had all these stories. We'd sit in the dirt and he'd play and plant. We'd do carrots and we had a garden, a big garden. We raised corn, all kinds of stuff. But the important thing was, is he was thinking about the future. It wasn't about the next 12 months. It wasn't about how much money I'm going to make off of it. It's about... How do we do it now, and how are we going to do it 100 years from now? And all of us, as we think about it, and you look at what's happened, and Iowa State's done a lot of studies on some of this stuff. And when they tell us that over the last 40 years, we've eroded 50% of our topsoil doing what we've been doing, I'm thinking, what are we telling our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids? That we're going to be out of the farming business? Hello? Let's, let's have our voices, let's, let's get out there. But uh, uh, I, I, it, it, I'm very proud to be here tonight and uh, to be uh, at least sort of a, a, a voice prior to uh, Dennis and Elizabeth. And I did get to hear Elizabeth earlier, and she really is feisty gal and uh, is, is out there. And her husband's a, a little feisty himself. As a matter of fact, he was, he was so feisty that, that in 1978, when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, this guy was the mayor of Cleveland. You know? yeah. And uh, um, I've got to tell you that, that uh, he may talk about that or he may not, but it's an interesting position because you can't hide in your own hometown. You see people on the street. You see them in your place of business. You see them in the grocery store. You see them at church. You see them at city hall. They call you in the middle of the night. My phone number's in the phone book, so you can call me. <laughs> and people are amazed that, that we actually do that. And because uh, some places around the world, why mayors and elected officials drive around in armored cars or something. But uh, I, I enjoy talking to our, our, our citizens. I enjoy talking about the future. And I've got to tell you, what do our people really want? They want food. They want shelter. They want a job. They want a good education, and they want opportunity, and they want it for themselves, and they want it for their families. And so I'm going to be excited tonight because I know that Dennis Kucinich and Elizabeth, but Dennis especially, since he sat in my, my chair, he knows that, that we have uh, spent a lot of time serving uh, with literally government in your face. And uh, it, it, is, it, is a, it is a moment where you, you can't back down. You can't say, I'll call you next week or next month, or we're going to vote on that next September. Citizens at the local level want an answer right now. If there's a pothole in the street, it needs to be fixed by tomorrow morning. If there's a problem with the sidewalk, it needs to be fixed. If the sewer needs to be fixed, we're out there to try to do it. So to all of you, thank you for everything that you're doing. Let's preserve this planet, this Earth, this Iowa, this Des Moines for our future generations, and I look forward to the other speakers this evening, and look forward to, to Dennis and Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Our next speaker will be Bill Stowe, General Manager of Des Moines Waterworks, and I can't tell you how inspirational guy he is. How many cities have a uh, general manager of the waterworks who is inspirational? This guy is phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, at Iowa CCI, we've had a great opportunity to collaborate with him. Frank has told me to be short. Both Franks have told me to be short. <laughs> I will be short. Farm Bureau.
Bureau conventioners. Oh, that's right, that's the speech I'll never get to make. <laughs> Fellow environmentalists, thank you for being here. Fight for clean water. Yeah. Mayor County, in one way or another, told me that was my job when I went to Des Moines Waterworks. That's what we do. We bring water to 500,000 islands, drinking water to 500,000 islands that comes out of the Des Moines Raccoon River. Industrial agriculture makes that an extraordinarily difficult job. Yes. Yep. Chemical fertilizers, CAFOs, yes. yep. 21 million hogs in a state that has 3 million people. Yep. Do the math. Does that <laughs> seem wrong to you? Oh, yes. yeah. Let's forget about the glow of feeding the world. Yes. And remember that hypoxia isn't just something in the Gulf of Mexico. Our waters here are dead. Go look at them and separate the truth from the falsity. You're going to continue to hear our environment is improving in Iowa. Yeah, our right. water is getting better. When you can go down there and look in that water and want to go in it, maybe it's getting better. Yeah. But that's not the condition now. Nope. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for your activism. Fight for clean water. Let's keep moving forward. Yeah. Fish. 
Another one dumped 200,000 gallons of manure into water. Another one, it was its fourth manure spill and it still is not shut down. So we're gonna start lifting up these manure spills and demanding that they get Clean Water Act permits and if they violate them, they need to be shut down. Yeah, we heard that. October 21st at 8.45 in the morning, we'll be done around 11.30 or noon at the CCI office if you'd like to join us. And the Voter Action Weekend also at the CCI office. Please join us. So Saturday, Sunday, and Tuesday, there's big things going on to improve our community. Thank you. dynamic speaker for sure, and co-founder of Catholic Workers Group here in Des Moines. And as mentioned before, he is the heart and soul of Occupy the World Food Prize event this week. I have two uh, tasks. I'm to uh, give a report on Occupy the World Food Prize and introduce uh, Dennis and Elizabeth. Uh, we're in our third year of Occupy the World Food Prize. We took our lessons uh, from two places, the Occupy Wall Street movement, which we all fondly remember, and our effort here in Iowa, Occupy the Caucuses. From the Occupy World, Occupy the Wall Street campaign, uh, this country discovered uh, something that was obvious that was hardly talked about. But because of Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street, we started talking about the problem of wealth in this country, the power of big money versus people. And they coined the phrase, the 1% and the 99%, a perfect, perfect phrase to speak about what we're up against. Uh, there are systems in this world right now that control the world, and it's the global, economic, financial, mechanisms. And St. Paul called them the powers and principalities. Uh, uh, in New York City, they have a place called Wall Street. And that's what they learn. The powers and principalities have a place called Wall Street, and they went there and occupied it, and broke the silence and the veneer of this country on the scam of wealth. Now, that's all they did. We wanted to do a lot more. I wish we had done a lot more. One of the unintentional consequences of Wall Street was that President Obama got himself elected the second time. Because if you remember that election, without the Wall Street Occupy folks breaking the veneer, Obama couldn't talk about wealth disparity at that time because the Republicans owned the turf. So that was not our intention, but they did get Obama elected. And the other uh, thing was the uh, caucuses. They brought those caucuses here, and we were in the midst of our Occupy and tenting and supporting people. And uh, we had a message with the caucuses that our folks in, at the Wall Street folks taught us. Uh, the message was that our election process, the mechanisms for democracy and electoral politics, is all bought and sold by the corporates. Uh, and uh, uh, the short answer of how they get away with this is they own everything. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Including the two parties. Yep. Yeah. All right, so that's a lesson learned. And then we also learned that for two weeks in Iowa, four times, or once every four years, all of the media, political media of the world comes to Iowa to see a good show bought by the corporates of the Democrats and the Republicans about what democracy is all about. Millions are spent for a two week to 10 day period. And what we discovered is that with a very few people, less than a hundred, pennies on the millions, we can get into the street 
and create an alternative narrative about what's going on. Uh, and, and change the discourse on pennies with 100 people willing to get busted and occupied. And from those lessons, the last three years, and this one including, Occupy the World Food Prize's message has been consistent. The corporate industrial agriculture is killing the planet. Yes. Uh, is the single largest... <laughs> it, is, it is the single largest global industry poisoning our land, our air, and our sea. Corporate ag owns this year World Food Prize. Yes. It's about braggy rights to the world. And they have spent millions and have bought governments, both state and federal, to have the bragging rights to say, we're the hope for the hungry world, corporate agriculture. And that's what this prize is all about. They have spent millions. And Occupy the World Food Prize have spent pennies on their millions with a few people in the last three years to raise up an alternative idea about feeding people and exposing the sham that happens at our state house. So be there next Thursday. You've heard all about it. That's what we're about. Dennis and Elizabeth, how did they get here? Well, the way it happened by my narrative and memory, Sharon got an email from Elizabeth saying, you know, my husband would like to talk at the Occupy World Food Prize event. Sharon was very excited. She called me. I heard it. I was kind of disappointed. He's a politician. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Catholic worker. We've been anarchists since the 30s. Uh, <laughs> Occupy the World Food Prize is anti-establishment. Uh, and, uh, uh, and but this is this is why I, this is my take on Dennis and, and his past life. Um, I'm, I'm a functioning anarchist. Uh, I take my lead from uh, Eamon Hennessy, a great Catholic worker in the 50s and the 60s, who, who said that loyalty to the people always, loyalty to the government when it deserves it. Uh, and I haven't seen much government that deserves it. But this is what I'll tell you, Dennis. If the Democrats sent people like Dennis to Washington, D.C., I'd be standing here before you, a Democrat. <laughs> no, no, no. When, when, when I found out he was coming, then I started learning about his wife, Elizabeth, and I'm saying, hold it. Elizabeth is the one we want to talk to. <laughs> so the woman knows what's going on. Check it out. I learned this. It's in the, it's in the program. She's the director of policy at the Center of Food Safety. And she was a producer of the film GMO OMG, a critically acclaimed documentary about GMOs. She's on the board and policy committee of the chair of the Rodell Institute. Uh, she's at the Center of Food Safety. She works to defend organic agriculture from the biotech industry through legal challenges. Uh, her crowd has successfully prevented at least seven potentially hazardous GE crops, including biopharmaceutical crops, from being commercialized. Uh, this crowd has been a key advocate for GE food labeling uh, at both the state and the federal level. Uh, in, in addition to the GMOOMG movie, Elizabeth is the producer of the documentary film Hot Water and an advisor of the ground operations battlefields of farm fields and the new groundbreaking PBS TV series Food Forward TV. This lady knows what's going on and she's been involved in the fight. So, uh, She accepted the invitation. We have both of them with us today. Just one more thing about Dennis. <laughs> he's, he's not a politician today. He's not looking for votes. 
Uh, he's here in what he's called uh, the Iowa uh, Terror to Peace, Terror to Peace Tour, with the message, it's time to redefine what national security means for the United States. Yes. You're in the right place. <laughs> Iowa occupying for the World Food Prize because we have to stop the war on the planet that takes place in wartime and in peacetime through the industrial food agricultural system. I give you Dennis and Elizabeth. <laughs> seed supply. 
Now we can look at a Bill Gates of this world who patented a little chip that went into a computer. Look at the enormous wealth that that small patent has brought to him. Now imagine that scaled up to our food supply. Every single one of us has to eat in order to live. So these patents and this whole GMO debate is not about increasing yields, it's about increasing profit and consolidating power. Yes. So there's two types of GMOs that we see pervasive in our system. There's pesticide producing GMOs and there's herbicide resisting GMOs. Now the herbicide resisting GMOs have been hailed as this extraordinary technology that allows us for the first time to spray toxic chemicals directly on our food. Fantastic! <laughs> now what has that done? We've got Roundup ready corn and soy. Roundup is glyphosate. Glyphosate now, uh, weeds now are resistant to glyphosate. As was mentioned before, um, I'm the director um, or one of the board directors on the Rodale Institute, which is the oldest organic research institute in America. <coughs> and what we've done over the last 30 odd years is a farm systems trial where we grow conventional next to organic, and for the last handful of years we've been growing GMO test plots as well to see yield, to see soil health, to look at water retention, all different kinds of issues. Now, when we started to grow GMOs, it was obviously a very contentious thing for us to, to choose to do, but we need to remain relevant in our research and really see what's happening to our fields. Now, growing Roundup Ready glyphosate resistant crops means that you, for the first time, have been able to spray herbicide directly onto a crop. So a plant will grow and this herbicide will hope, well, the farmers hope, will kill all of the weeds around it so that this, this plant can grow. Well, with, after three years, we found that, actually, weeds were becoming resistant to glyphosate. And so we had to start using something else. We have a glyphosate, and then we have to mix in atrazine. So we're using glyphosate and atrazine on our fields after three years. After another couple of years, more resistant weeds to glyphosate and atrazine now having to use 2,4-D. 2,4-D is half of the component of Agent Orange. Who knows about Agent Orange? Yes. Good thing. Nasty stuff. Not really. High in dioxins. Awful chemical. Dennis and I spoke last night in um, Cedar Rapids, and we were at a veterans hall. And as we were talking about redefining national security, a veteran came up to me afterwards, a veteran of the Vietnam War. And he said to me, Elizabeth, you have to do something about 2,4-D. You've got to work on these, on these so-called Agent Orange crops, because the way that the, um, the industry now is understanding that and they're putting out the figures, 80 million acres of American cropland is now blighted with herbicide resistant weeds. <coughs> so we have these super weeds all over our land. And that's causing an issue to food security because if you've got weeds growing that you can't get rid of, then what are we actually going to be growing our food in? Instead of just weeds, you can't eat them. So industry's um, solution to this is genetic stacking. So not only do we have now glyphosate resistant uh, GMOs, but recently, in the last week, the federal government agreed that we can have two 4D resistant GMOs. So they genetically stacked these two traits of glyphosate resistant and two 4D resistant. So we are now able to, sooner we'll be there meeting a field near you, spraying two 4D on millions of acres of American cropland. This is going to be directly in our food supply, directly onto our food. So, there's this mentality that we have, both within our national security, that domination and force and, and some kind of chemical and, and, and aggression towards something will stop something. We know that the war on terror has failed. We're breeding more terror with the very mechanism that we're doing. It's a level of consciousness. The same is true of our fields. We have a chemical warfare with nature, and guess what? Nature is out evolving us. So this, as we see the, the technologies of warfare that have transitioned onto our fields, we're seeing the inevitability of death actually of our society. So water pollution and all of those kinds of things. I want to see a world beyond GMOs. We have extraordinary research that's come out of Iowa University, that's come out of the Rodale Institute, that's come out of family farms all across the world that actually organic agriculture yields the same, if not more, than GMO crops do. But not only that, the profitability is $200 per acre more than GMOs are. Not only that, but if we really are stewards of the land, 
if we really do care about our urban, uh, sorry, about our rural resources of land, and we care about our farmers, we will create systems that actually help people to transition their land and look after and become true stewards of the soil. Because we cannot continue to see the depletion of our soils. We will not be able to feed ourselves. But with organic agriculture, we can put back that plant matter. There is some amazing things that the Rodale Institute is doing, really looking at, if you, if you understand the GMOs, you'll be spraying this chemical on, and so when you look at um, GMO, as you know, when as you look at a corn field, the earth is barren. It's completely dry, it's crispy, nothing really grows up in it. That means that all the water is evaporating. So these crops are dry, so we're having to use more, more and more water resources on these kinds of things. What we do at the Road End Institute, we, we have cover crops. And cover crops not only put more plant matter into the soil, not only fix nitrogen into the soil, which inevitably feeds the next crop that grows on it, but we use a roller crimper that rolls those cover crops, chops them up at the front end, and at the back, we cut a seam into what is now a kind of carpet, a sort of a plant carpet, so that, which is suppressing weeds and keeping <coughs> moisture in, and we plant the seeds in this. And weeds are suppressed, water is, and moisture is kept in, the, the plants grow up and when you look at organic fields, they're a wonderful mix of biodiversity. There's all different kinds of insects, there's all different kinds of plant growth, and they are a lot greener and they're a lot taller. It's incredible to see in the Rodale Institute, they actually have um, GMO fields around them, all around them. And so you can see the stark contrast between the two methods. And you see this life and you see the strength of the plants. So not only are they stronger, not only is the soil extraordinary, not only is the water retained, but also these plants are more resistant to extremes in temperatures and, and to extremes of the climate change. So we see that um, soil that has high, um, high plant matter in it actually clumps. And instead of when, when it's put into water, it, it holds together. Soil that has been depleted just falls apart and is all silty. Well, when you have this wonderful organic soil, water that we have excess water and flooding, it is, the land is less prone to that. It will absorb more, more moisture. The, the water will come in. Roots will be longer. And so plants then, in times of drought, will have more of an opportunity to, uh, to live and also to thrive. So we've got this amazing thing, but also, because of these methods, because of healthy soil, because of the opportunity to have cover crops, when we look at regenerative organic agriculture methods, the, all the land, all around us, all agricultural land, your gardens, anything that, that is around us, can actually become carbon sinks. So we are putting so much carbon up into the atmosphere. And yet, if all of the agricultural land actually took up organic regenerative agriculture methods, we could actually sequester 56 gigatons of carbon. It's all that we throw up there, we can bring back down. So instead of having, as we do now with the depletion of our land, with soil actually being a carbon pump, putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, it can be the most effective sink. It can start pulling it down. So this is the potential for agriculture. You are right on the front line. I am so glad I'm not in a plane flying overhead <laughs> in some poor Godforsaken country. I am here with you. We will do this together. You are in the most extraordinary position as Iowans to really turn this debate. That when those candidates come through, that you really stand up and you let them know exactly what you feel as Iowans and you vote exactly for what you want. And I am so thrilled to be here in Des Moines with you leaders who are standing for the issues on the right side of the issues. As I was when Dennis and I were in Cedar Rapids yesterday, I can't believe the leadership that's already in local government and I'm so thankful to be with you today. Elizabeth, thank you very much, and uh, I am very privileged to be here uh, with my wife and with all of you, and uh, you've heard Elizabeth speak, and uh, you can understand 
that as we go around Iowa, uh, that she is having impact with her knowledge of agriculture. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the presence, of course, of, of the mayor and to say that uh, as someone who has served in that capacity, I, I, I understand uh, the kind of commitment that you have because it's local government that is closest to the people. It's local government that uh, sees the impact of policies on so many different levels. And it's local government, because it's closest to the people, that it has the path towards resolving a lot of the problems that exist at a state and a national level. So uh, I would ask all of you to join me in, in showing appreciation for uh, the service of the Honorable Mayor uh, to this great community. Wow. And the uh, uh, cities exist through various systems, of course, and having someone who is in charge of a water system who is so committed to the environment is, is something that is, is a huge matter, especially when uh, you learn of the degree of agricultural runoff that, that occurs and how important it is. That I can imagine how you feel every day monitoring uh, the, the different uh, uh, factors that go into water quality, and, and if you're concerned, protect the health uh, of the people of, of Des Moines. So we salute you as well. Thank you. Uh, Frank Cordero, I can tell you that I understand the uh, uh, misgivings that you've had about having someone who's been in politics appear before improving <laughs> citizens. Uh, my, my own approach to politics actually is, has come out of the Catholic worker movement by uh, Dorothy Day as someone who has, whose life has had a profound impact on my own and uh, having been a benefit of a, of a parochial education uh, and, and, and had the opportunity to really focus on the principles, the spiritual principles that, that motivate service to people. I, I understand the importance of the gathering that we have here today because there's something profound that goes way beyond politics, that goes to matters of the human heart and the human spirit, that bind us as human beings, that cause us to want to rally in support of each other and in support of our community and the world. That's what brings Elizabeth and I to Iowa. That's what brought us to uh, Iowa City and Cedar Rapids as part of an effort to start a whole new national conversation on what constitutes national security. And what we heard from the people of Iowa City and the people of Cedar Rapids and from some people in Des Moines at an earlier meeting is that the people of Iowa see national security in a way that is different than what Washington is expressing. They see national security in terms of human security. That uh, as one nation, our security resides in the security of our food supply. Our security resides in the security of jobs. Our security resides in the security of a decent wage, in the security of a roof over one's head. Our security resides in the security of education and opportunities for ourselves and our children. Our security resides in the quality of health care for ourselves and our family. Our security resides in making sure that when someone has worked a lifetime, that there will be a retirement benefit that will enable them to live the rest of their lives in dignity. Our security involves protection of the environment, our air, our water, our land and realizing that our sacred responsibility is as stewards of our environment. The philosopher, um, there, we, we're familiar with Chief Seattle who said that the earth does not belong to us, we belong to the earth. <coughs> Expressing the sentiment that we are all one that we are all interdependent and interconnected and that what happens to any one of us affects all of us. 
And that, and that acting from that awareness, acting from that oneness, we work to bring about the restoration of our environment, the repair of our environment, the regeneration of our agricultural system. We're essentially commanded to make peace with our brother, brothers and sisters and also to make peace with the rest of the world. The connection between a safe environment and peace is unmistakable. The connection between our economic rights and peace is unmistakable. Today, we celebrate the birth, 124 years ago, of a president who may not have been so heralded when he served, but whose words and sentiments continue to echo more strongly through the years. And that is today is the birthday of President Dwight David Eisenhower. I want to read to you something that he said. Well, he, we're all familiar with what he said about the military-industrial complex and about its influence in matters of state. He also said that every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies, in a final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. If you enlarge that message in a, in a spiritual sense, it brings you back to Matthew 25. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? Whatever you do for these, the least of the brethren, you do for a spiritual mission. We've gotten away from that. We've gotten away from a spiritual understanding of, the, of this interconnectivity. We've gotten away from the promise of, of America and its first motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many we are one. It wasn't just about the unity of the states or the colonies, it was about human unity. And so your presence here helps to reconfirm some basic values that are so important to Americans. Values that are signified uh, in a legend right below this auditorium that talks about trustworthiness, about responsibility, about respect, about values that have to do with the preservation of our nation. The steps that we have to take have to come, though, from an awareness of the present position of the political system. As mayor, I remember the responsibility I had to save the city's municipal electric system when corporations tried to force me to sell it. And so I'm not, I wasn't naive when I got to Congress. But what I learned in the federal government is that when people say, you know, local government I know can work, but people will say, oh, Washington doesn't work. Well, it does work. The question is, who's it working for? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I received an object lesson early on when I saw corporate interests try to declare that sludge was organic. Yeah, right. And with help of many people in this room and people across America, we were able to rouse the American public to say, look, they're trying to change the nature of, of organic to, to basically include the poisons that are in sludge. And the public beat that back. And then the next thing that happened, in 1999, I was driving uh, to Washington from Cleveland, and I heard a report on the radio about a study of monarch butterflies that had fed on milkweed that was contaminated by, uh, uh, by uh, GMO, and that there was a high degree of, of mortality among these butterflies. And it got me thinking, wait a minute, if this is what happens to butterflies, what could be the effect on other organisms, including human beings, and other species, including human beings. So 
What I did as a, as, as a result of the report was to go to Congress and begin to see if anybody's ever talked about this before. And I found out, to my surprise, no one had. And I dug a little bit deeper, and I, it occurred to me that with so many millions of acres of genetically modified uh, crops that had already been planted, I wondered, how did this happen? And what I found out was that in 19, through my research, was that in 1992, in the closing days of the uh, first uh, President Bush, that the, uh, that the Food and Drug Administration made a ruling that declared that gen genetically modified organisms were the functional equivalent of conventional foods. Yeah, right. Now, there, there was not a body of research attached to that finding, at least anything that had been disclosed. Uh, there was no peer-reviewed science behind that research. There was no respect to the precautionary principle behind that research. What we saw was simply an assertion that was made without any science behind it, an assertion that was you know, no doubt propelled by political considerations. So I thought that the prudent thing to do, at least to protect the American people, would be to give them an awareness that the food that they are consuming uh, is, uh, it contains genetically modified organisms. After all, if we are what we eat, we should take care to know what's in the food we are consuming so that we know what we will become. <laughs> and so I drafted legislation for the purpose, for the first time uh, anywhere, drafted legislation to label all genetically modified organisms that are in food to label them as GMOs. And I, I thought that this legislation would be, since polls had already been taken that showed that 90% of the American people at least were prepared to support labeling, I thought this should be easy. <laughs> well, I was still new at the time. <laughs> and what I, what I found out, though, as soon as the legislation was introduced, uh, Monsanto and, and, and their lobbyists began to contact uh, certain leaders in Congress. And having a few dozen sponsors to the bill didn't mean anything because the leadership had already been told, we're not going anywhere with this legislation, despite the fact that the American people, at least 90%, wanted labeling of genetically modified organisms. I introduced a companion piece of legislation that said this, that all genetically modified foods should be evaluated for allergenicity, toxicity, functional characteristics, and, and, and other uh, matters, and so that we could at least observe the precautionary principle before the proliferation of these GMOs. Once again, uh, the, the industry came in, lo lobbied Congress, and blocked even so much as a hearing. I introduced another piece of legislation that said that any farmer who's growing organic crops, who has his crops or her crops contaminated by genetically modified organisms, must be indemnified and be able to have a cause of action against the company that made the product and caused the contamination of the organic crops. This was at a time this was at a time that the industry began to sue farmers whose crops were contaminated with GMOs, claiming there was a, 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 a copyright infringement or patent infringement. So what we have here is, is you know, represented is a, a condition which requires all of us to stand up and look at the implications that uh, this corporate control of, of agriculture has had. It's really a restriction of our freedom. Yes. And, our, and as Americans, we, we value our freedom. And if we the people means anything, 
It means that we have to have control over our food supplies and cannot just uh, be fed our genetically engineered veggies and like it. That we have to have the ability to stand up and speak out <coughs> and to act. What Elizabeth and I have found out in our travels across Iowa already is that the people in Iowa are prepared to change the national discussion. That the people that are not Iowa, that the people in Iowa, the people in this room are ready to redefine what national security is, to include food security, and to talk about a new approach to agriculture that permits us not only to enshrine sustainability as, a, as our goal, which so many people, as Elizabeth and I joined in New York City in marching in that climate march last month, but also to take a new direction, which involves uh, regenerative agriculture, an approach that is designed to build soil health, an approach which is designed to, um, to understand that organic practices, which uh, include cover crops, and uh, residue mulching and composting and crop rotation are absolutely essential to creating the kinds of, of carbon sinks that help to change the dynamic from the increased amount of atmospheric <coughs> CO2, which industrial agriculture contributes to mightily, to achieving a reconciliation with nature through organic agriculture, which continues uh, to be a path towards a future where the planet itself can survive. Uh, we, were told, we have been told by the great philosopher, Thomas Berry, that the great work of our life should be to establish a reconciliation with the natural world. Think about the power that we have the power that, that goes beyond politics. It is, a, it is a spiritual mission to reconnect with clean water, to reconnect with clean air, to reconnect with land that is, that is not defiled, to be able to prove to future generations, our children, our children's children, that we, are the, that we were the stewards of a planet that worked on repairing our planet, that worked on restoring our planet, that worked on regenerating our planet through a new approach to agriculture, which has been used for hundreds of years, but it's new again here in 2014. And Iowa is the place to show that it works, to start the new discussion, to change America, and to change the world. Thank you very much. you know, 10, 20, 30 story uh, uh, greenhouse type farming uh, fit into this? Well, vertical farming is a, an amazing way that we can uh, see food security brought into our urban areas. Uh, so it's a very interesting model. I know that there are a lot of people in DC who are very excited about that. But I have to say that my particular interest is really in soil and it's really in being in contact with the earth and making sure that the micronutrients and the microbiome that is in this extraordinary land that we live on 
um, is farmed in a way and nurtured in a way um, that can really help us with, with our own health and with our own vitality. I'm uh, Tommy Schmitz. Uh, I'm so happy I were one of the uh, fortunate five people to uh, walk across the country for Dennis in 2003, 2004, and uh, uh, for uh, his presidential campaign. Also for uh, uh, to promote um, uh, the peace, the, the Department of Peace concept, which has gone away, which we still need, and um, but also to uh, remind everybody that in 2003 that we needed to get the heck out of Iraq. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing after 11 years that... Uh, uh, but at the same time, it was a beautiful experience. My question to you is... <laughs> my question to you is more of a challenge. Well, first of all, my question is, can I have a ride home? <laughs> no, uh, my question is... is uh, because of your influence, I've become a Catholic worker, and I'm a colleague of Frank Cordero's. And because of your influence, I am a personalist in the true spirit of Peter Moran. Personalist is a deeper, more fundamental level of anarchy. Personalist. My question is a challenge. Have you read Peter Kropotkin, and will you do so in the, within the view that you have right now? Um, I, I have read uh, fairly intensively uh, a number of historians and philosophers from the 20th century uh, who were instrumental in creating change in government at every level in countries uh, around the world, and people who were instrumental in the 18th century, in the 19th and 18th century, uh, which is why I know this. I know that there is a power in this room. It is a power of transformation. I know that what brings each person in this room is a, is a journey of life experience that has given you the ability, one time or another, to take a stand that has changed things. When you start catalyzing that, it changes everything. And so, I, I, I having been to Iowa since uh, 2000, and the first time in 2003, and, and seeing this process here, Iowa is, is the door to the world on, on, on a whole range of issues, but particularly agriculture. So I, I thank you for uh, asking, you know, what my, my, my reading tastes are quite eclectic. But they're, they're not only matters of, of public policy, they're matters of philosophy, they're, they're spiritual reflection. Because we're not simply uh, flesh and bones. The human spirit means something, the spirit of America means something. And just think, if the, if the spirit of the world which moves is infused with the kind of caring and compassion and love and intention to repair the world, think of the power that we have, just in our awareness, but when we put it into action. That's where I come from, and I appreciate your commitment as well. Thank you very much. For the uh, folks, uh, I understand the Rodell Institute is um, advocating mycelium as a means of improving soil and uh, cleaning up groundwater. Elizabeth, is there anything that you might be able to say about that tonight? Or? Not tonight. All right. <laughs> Thank you. First and foremost, I, I just want to say I've followed not just this aspect, but your kind of your career, and, and uh, as a Iowan that has a, a little three-year-old boy, I want to say thank you very much, just pretty much for all of it, <laughs> Dennis. And uh, um, I was wondering if you have followed any of the recent, uh, uh, I guess, class action lawsuits going on against Syngenta, and I, you know, I honestly think that is hopefully going to be a key to kind of break in uh, into uh, GMO drift and protecting farmers that want to try something different. Uh, and I also think something that's going to go on here is uh, uh, this year I'm really hoping the Libertarian Party will get uh, more than 2% of the vote.
because I think, you know, uh, people kind of get the wrong idea of what's going on in Iowa with the Libertarian Party, because I think corporate control, you know, food liberty is going to start to become an issue with those types of people as well, and I think we'll, you know, we're all in this together, and I think, uh, uh, I guess really just if you thought maybe those recent lawsuits might have any, you know, do any good for breaking us away from corporate control. Uh, first of all, there, there's two points you raised. The first one is, yes, it's important to support the farmers who are involved in these lawsuits that uh, essentially they're trying to reclaim their right to be able to, to farm, to be able to um, create products that are not uh, contaminated to be able to have control over their over the seed and all those other things. I mean, that is essential to uh, be able to uh, support farmers who right now uh, are, are up against it and trying to survive against the uh, great power of, of, of corporations. So, uh, yes, and again, here in Iowa, it's a place where uh, people understand the struggle that farmers have had, the struggle they've had for parity over the years. When you think about the American economy and how it got into trouble, it got into trouble when the family farms uh, became decimated because those family farmers, those family farmers were making just from all the purchases they made, of all the inputs that went into agriculture, these small businesses around Iowa and around the country were actually generators of the economy. They were powerful generators of the economy. And so you had two things happen. One is the decline of the family farm, and then the rise of the military industrial complex, which, which wasted trillions of dollars. So if we can change the dynamic and restore the family farm, as Elizabeth's working on to try to help veterans uh, make some uh, a transition into farming, but also to restore the family farm and, and, and flip the equation on this military industrial complex to start to, to say, look, we, want, we have a right to be secure as a nation. We have a right to national security. But don't tell us our national security is only about bombs, is only about uh, uh, spending all this money. We have a right to start using the priorities of our country to talk about human security here at home. And that's what I'm hearing from Iowa. And I'd like to hear. Uh, I saw the teacher moving towards you as you started to talk about the political party. I, I, now I know what this is about. Uh, I, I have to tell you, uh, uh, gentle lady, that when I got up to speak and I saw this is pretty intimidating. Uh, really? This don't get anything I saw in Congress, you know. Uh, but let me say that one of the things that I learned from my approach in Washington, it wasn't, it wasn't partisan. I never got to the floor of the House and declared that the truth of, the, of America was uh, deposited or reposed in one political party. Oh boy, did I know differently than that in, in you know, attending my own Democratic caucus. But the other thing I need to do is to, is to uh, attack people based on the fact that they may have been another party. What we need to do in this country, more than ever at this time, is to find our commonalities, is to come together without regard to political party, without regard to ideology, and find those thing as things as Americans which unite us, and to start to talk in terms of Americans and as citizens of the world. We have an opportunity to redefine who we are and redefine what it means to be an American, which now is unfortunately being hijacked by a few ideologues who want to, who want to say that America is only about war. No, it's not. It's about peace. It's about restoration. No, it's actually a green. Very important point here about our 
own food choices. And this, is, this goes back truly to the question of empowerment. So we can often think, well, Washington has all the power. There's these big corporations with money that have all the power. I can't do anything. Who am I? Well, our plates make a difference. What we choose to eat and put in our bodies makes a primary difference to our own health to start with. But also what we choose to eat also is, an ex is a direct relation to the business or the farm or the industry that we are supporting at the same time. Industrial animal agriculture, if you read one report in World Watch, which was written by um, some people from the IMF, Robert Goodland, they said that 51% of the world's greenhouse gases comes from industrial animal agriculture. And this is from the farms, this is from the, the, when we uh, cut down the rainforest and the carbon that comes from that, from, from the soil that's come, from the way that we're growing our crops, the row crop and the monocultures, all of that adds to greenhouse gases. So the single thing that we can do as individuals is to buy local, buy organic, and eat as many fruits and vegetables as possible, and as little as meat, meat as possible. So and this is, this is really an important issue. But beyond just that, beyond saving the world, we're also looking at our own health. So I used to be the director of policy at, no, I wasn't, I was the government affairs director at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And PCRM's sole work, really, is looking at the prevention and reversal of disease through plant-based nutrition. And they've done all of this research into type 2 diabetes, looking at heart, heart disease, all different kinds of, of major illnesses that we are facing in the United States and all around the world now. These non-communicable diseases. And guess what? Food is the building blocks to them too. So when we see a diet rich in fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, that is the diet that not only will save the planet, but also save ourselves. Um, I'd like to add a personal note on that. Uh, from the time I was a child until uh, mid-adulthood, uh, I suffered uh, seriously from Crohn's disease. And uh, at, at age 20, I had some pretty serious surgery under a life-threatening condition. And it was in 1995, uh, a friend introduced me to a vegan diet, just happenstance, not because I was searching for some relief. At that point, I was on all kinds of medications to try to control the, the Crohn's, and, uh, and antibiotics, and had a, it, it, life was tough. I, I never missed a day of work or school on account of it, but it was tough. Anybody who knows anyone who's suffered with that or any kind of gastrointestinal illness understands that it can be pretty difficult. But I changed my diet. I, I, I was introduced to a vegan diet, and I changed, I changed my diet. And I started to see within, just within a few weeks, a dramatic change in my own health, in the symptoms that I had dealt with most of my life. It was unbelievable to, to see that you could change your diet and suddenly your health would change. And uh, then with the, with the help of a little bit of Chinese herbal medicine to rebuild my intestinal flora, I suddenly, the Crohn's went away, and people say, that can't happen. It did, I'm telling you, it did. Yes. So why am I sharing this with you? I'm sharing this with you for a couple of reasons. First of all, there are some, there are some health reasons that people might uh, take to change their diet, and it can lead to full health. Uh, and also, uh, the fact that, you know, the big debate about health care, about the cost of health care. You and I know the government, you know, for better or for worse, cannot give us health care. An insurance company that might pay the bills, private insurance, while charging us an arm and a leg to be covered, they don't give us health care, that we make choices. Since our, our visit to Iowa, and, and a message we want to take across Iowa is about self-empowerment. It's about making choices, our, reclaiming our ability to make choices that can help to make a better life for ourselves. So I found that through my own experience, just kind of stumbled into it, but I wanted to share it with you tonight, just to say that today, you know, I have a blood pressure about 90 over 60. If I get it taken at the hospital, they ask, are you, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I am. I'm stronger than ever. Uh, but, but it was a path, a journey. And, and, it, and I was able to reclaim it by taking a different route. We can reclaim our power as Americans by authenticating our own experience and collectively coming together to say, you know, America could take a different direction and we ought to start thinking about it. Next question.
Michael Slattery. I'm with the Wisconsin Farmers Union. Uh, I've only voted for a Democrat once. I worked for you in 2002 to get elected. Sorry you didn't win. It would be better than what we've got now. <laughs> um, anyway, the two questions that I would like you to address. They aren't a question. One is uh, the 34 Act and the 48 Act that provided parity for farm products is no longer effective. And because of that, farmers are squeezed. I'd like you to address that. Second issue I'd like you to address is the issue of monopolistic and oligopolistic control of both the inputs and the outputs of farming. Great questions. Simply put, <laughs> we, it, is, it is urgent that America uses its Justice Department to break up the horizontal and vertical monopolies in agriculture. Because I heard that's, that. Yeah, that's what it is. I mean, Monsanto's and Subjectives and others who want to dictate to people. It's really a question of human freedom. It really comes down to freedom. Whether we're free to be able to determine the kind of agriculture that we want that sustains the planet and enables soil regeneration and can uh, make, the, make the world better uh, than it was be, uh, before us. Now, uh, the, the, the question of parity. It's the lack of parity that has produced this avalanche of debt. You know, when, when the, when the, it's really incredible when you think about the priorities of the government. I talked earlier about be sure that government works the question is who it's working for. When you look at how the government, the, uh, the, the federal government rushed to bail out Wall Street. You know, I, I, I was one of the ones who led the effort against the bailouts and said, you shouldn't have any kind of talk about bailout. You should be talking about helping people write down their mortgages so that they can stay in their homes, right. so that they can stay in their farm, so that they can stay in their business. Not a good way, just to simply enable people to, to, to hang on to that American dream. So when it comes to agriculture, the only way that we can reclaim agriculture is, is to make, not the only way, but one of the most powerful and potent ways is to make sure that if someone goes into, into farming, if someone wants to establish a family farm or save their family farm, we've got to go back to the concept of parity. Because without parity, without being able to get uh, back what you put in and being able to reclaim and make it a decent business, there's not going to be any family farmers. All there's going to be is the corporate farmers. We're moving in that direction. That's a place for America to stand for. Okay, I'm sorry, but we're at the end of our Q and A, and um, just want to give out a couple uh, sort of reminders. Number one, if you didn't have a chance to put some money in the basket, I'm sure there's somebody that can be standing at the doorway. Uh, if that dollar bill was just too deep in your pocket, you couldn't get it at it conveniently. Um, it's only somebody back there. Also, Adam, you guys got your clipboards out there still? For yes. People? Volunteers. Just, just as back there with the clipboard. Uh, if you want to continue the fight, if you want to change the political landscape, if you want to see more influential people like Dennis and Elizabeth Pachinik, we need people on the forefront. We need people out there. We need, we need you to put your feet in the street. Um, so... Um, Anyway, I'll see my card. Frank, anything else? Yeah, we passed the hat around the first time. We got $300. Wonderful. But we have about $700 more expenses. If you can help us out, fine. We're occupied. We're not going to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, thank you again. And, and Elizabeth and I are so grateful to have been here. And one thing I, I want to uh, leave you with this thought. That, that our presence here is not about a candidacy. It is about working to empower Iowa so that Iowa can change the discussion nationally. And, and, and so we're available, uh, not on this trip, but in the future to come to other communities. And anyone who wishes to contact us, either a follow-up right now uh, or to uh, down the road, uh, you can reach us through Kucinich.com. Is that right? Kucinich.com. And we'll be happy to be in touch. We, we, we understand that there's a moment in history here that can be seized, that can change everything. And we're so grateful that you've given us this opportunity to share some thoughts with you about a path to making it happen. Thank you so much.
Remind the reception. One more song. All right, I'm going to sing you out of here. All right, yeah. I love coming to Iowa. I've been farming up in Wisconsin for 30 years, but I'm from Boone. Graduated from Iowa State. So it's great to be at home. Why don't you go up there right now and say something? Oh, just a second. Oh, there's a reception right next door when you uh, head out of here. Cookies and coffee Cookies from the worker. Thank you. Sing it out there. All right, I'm going to sing you out of here. Have a good evening. We're so glad you're here. This is one I wrote. It's got a snappy chorus. You'll pick it up. Maybe you want to sing it.
shorten this up a little bit. Balance to the messaging that we get from the chemical companies yes. that regenerate organic agriculture. Everything you've been talking about <laughs> in this land is wonderful. We have a governor that appoints a homer in the cheap part of the factory for Bob Farm Network. And we have filtered the discussion in our line with everything that we do. So my neighbor who graduated from Iowa State. It's Alec, and Branstad, who I call Brain Dead, is one. Of, he was one of the co-founders of Alec, American Legislative Exchange Council. And it's Council. all that power of corporations yep. again that he yep. kept talking. About. Oh yeah, yeah. When we can, uh, when we can send Alec down to Crapper. Yes. That'll be a happy day.